and welcome to another World of UX podcast. This is your host, Darren Hood. Thanks for taking the time to join me on today. Welcome, those of you who are listening for the first time. We're taking some time to extend the celebration of the fourth anniversary of the World of UX podcast. We've been doing this now for four years. We're heard in over 100 countries. We have people all over the place that are tapping in and um, engaging with people all over the world. Thanks to those of you who deemed us worthy enough to listen. Thanks to those of you who hate us uh, because you actually prove we're doing something good. If everybody loves you, something's wrong. <laughs> so, uh, but we are extending our celebration of the of the anniversary. I'm doing a few solo episodes and we're going to have some interviews sprinkled here and there. And we are going solo today. And I actually decided I, I was going a different direction initially. And then I had a post that I did on, on social media and it just hit me. Why don't we cover that topic today? We've talked about it before a little, but not quite the way we're going to talk about it here today. We're going to revisit a topic, but we're sort of building on it. And today I want to talk about the topic of the dysfunction, inequitability, and incivility of today's UX hiring landscape. Just talking about some things that are going on in hiring, some things that I want to put on people's radar, because these are things that we need to resolve. These are things that we need to fix. And I seem to be one of the people whose job it is to call out things that are happening in UX today that are doing us all. I mean, you might be getting the jobs, you might be comfortable, you might think that you're doing okay. And for people like me, no matter where I am, and I talk the same way, whether I'm working or not, and whether I'm in a great job or not, and no matter what's going on, my voice and my tone does not change. And the reason for that is that no matter what's going on with me, I'm not going to go into selfish mode and just start talking about things from my perspective. I'm always trying to look at the entire discipline. I make it my business to talk to people throughout the discipline. I make it my business to read people's posts on social media. I make it my business to know what's going on, not just in the company I work in, but across the board. And when we take the time to do these things, it helps me to have a perspective that's not my own. It helps me to have a perspective that revolves around the entire discipline. It helps us to, to understand what's happening and then to address these things, taking my 28 plus years and putting in the work for everyone's benefit. And the focus today is on the hiring landscape. I want to call out five different things. A couple of them are more directly related, but I'm going to focus on five different things that I've seen, some of which I've experienced, some of which actually everything I've experienced here, I've talked to other people about it as well. So, I, but I, when I talk about it from my experience, there's going to be a bit more depth a lot of times because I'm the one that experienced it firsthand. And when I talk to you about what somebody else experienced, sometimes it's secondhand or thirdhand. And, and the firsthand experiences are always going to, they're going to have more of an authority behind it because we know it for ourselves as opposed to hearing it from somebody else. So I just want you to understand my perspective. But we're going to talk about five different things here. We're going to elaborate on these things. Again, I don't think there's been a time where I, I mean, I, I've talked about all these things before to some extent, but we want to look at it from a little bit of a different lens today. And I want everybody to understand that everything I'm bringing up is dysfunctional. Everything that I'm bringing up reeks of, of inequitability. In other words, it's not fair to someone. And, and there's a great degree of incivility. There's a lot of unethical stuff that's happening. Yeah, it, it reminds you of the Sinister. <laughs> we talked about some of these things during the, during the Sinister series. But we have to be aware of these things. Of, I'm thankful to those people who written me and said, thank you for calling these things out. We need to know about these things. Thank you for calling these things out. I thought I was losing it until I heard you talk about it. Because you know, the way that we keep our head is because we reconcile the different things that, that we experience, whether it's good or bad, we need to understand what we've experienced so we can understand how we need to dissect it and, and how much value to place upon things. And when we don't do that, 
and we just sort of have a, a free for all kind of a life, and we just we just exist. We're not really excelling. We're not trying to find out ways to get better. We don't understand how well we did with something or how poorly we did. So it's important to to understand what's happening, whether it's a favorable thing or unfavorable, whether it's comfortable or uncomfortable, whatever happens. And we all experience all of these things. Wherever we are is good for us to reconcile it, understand it, digest it, and then come back and be ready to do what's going to benefit you the most, what's going to help you to be your absolute best. So that that's why I talk about these things. Some people say it's negative. Uh, I say that those people lack emotional intelligence. If, if they, we all experience things that are uncomfortable, challenging, what some people would call negative, but if you take the time to digest it, you will eventually understand, hey, this is what happened. This is what I see. And now because of that, this is what I need to do. And you don't think about, I mean, I talked before about the fact that I don't like the term negative because it, it has a tendency to sort of run you into a pit and put you in a position where you don't feel you have an out. You don't have any action you can take. I prefer the terms constructive and destructive because when you hear something that is unfavorable, when you experience something that is uncomfortable and you take the time to just embrace the fact and face the fact, hey, that happened. I didn't like it. It wasn't comfortable. It, it, it hurt me. Then you take the time to face what really happened and embrace it. You will eventually say, you'll tell yourself, okay, so this happened. What do I do now? How can I build off of what happened? And that's the emotionally intelligent way to respond to something that may not have been very favorable or, or something that tasted good. Let's use that metaphor, if you will. So we're going to talk about some dysfunction. We're going to talk about the inequitable behaviors and attitudes and things that we encounter and talk about the incivility, knowing that out of these things, we can rise above it, knowing that out of these things, we can still be our best selves knowing that because we experience these things, they don't turn into something. It's not the end. It's the beginning of a new chapter. So let's look at it that way. Okay. So, so that way we'll help those who are emotionally intelligent and can digest what I just said. Thank you for that. And those who are, it's still negative. Uh, no, that's, that's, that's neurotic. That's, that's not good. And I challenge you to rise above that. That's not good. And you're not going to come away from that being constructive. So I uh, challenge you to let that stuff go. So number one, in our world of UX, as it pertains to hiring, when you talk to and listen to a lot of people, whether they're hiring managers or people that are trying to get jobs, especially the less experience these people have, the, the number one item of currency to a lot of people is a portfolio. What is a portfolio? It's basically a representation of who you are. <laughs> Asterisk. Because it can only represent so much. A lot of what we do in UX is not something that can be demonstrated on paper. It's something that can only come out of a conversation. It's something that can only come out of examination of the past examination of how you think. And, and a portfolio won't necessarily do that. Something else about portfolios as downright criminal is that the vast majority of portfolio reviews happen asynchronously. They happen without or outside the presence of the individual whose portfolio is being reviewed. So now you don't have that person there to give you some play-by-play -play commentary, to give you color, to give you context. Because a lot of people, when they review portfolios, and, and, and we've said this a hundred times, we say it again, a lot of people reviewing portfolios do not know how to review portfolios. We assume they know how to review portfolios. They really don't. And so when they're looking at it, and then they're looking at it asynchronously, in other words, for those that don't know, because everybody doesn't know what that means, Again, that means that the person whose portfolio is being reviewed is not there. So now it's left up to interpretation. It's left up to biases. It's left up to someone's moods. It's left up to someone who reviewed it after they just had an argument with their spouse or significant other. And now they're reviewing it and they're distracted. They're upset. 
They're, they're, they're not in their best position. And so they're not in a position to review your portfolio. You don't have their undivided attention. Some people, when they review portfolios, they go through them so fast that they really don't know what's going on. And then because a lot of times they're suffering from Dunning-Kruger and because they lack emotional intelligence and because they lack honesty, you hear the inequitability, the dysfunction and the incivility in that, they make a judgment even though they were not in the position to really make a judgment, to make a call on what they just reviewed. And they do it over and over. A lot of times the person who gets hired or the person who, who, who moves forward in the interview process is the person who happened to be the person whose work got reviewed when the person happened to be in their best absolute mood. So it was, it was just the luck of the draw. It had nothing to do with skill. It had nothing to do with what the portfolio looked like. And we're not even mentioning the fact that portfolios a lot of times are nothing more than a beauty contest. I love somebody says, shout out to Ben Woods. He's the one who coined that phrase and I use it over and over again. So if you ever heard me say that, I got that from Ben Woods. He's been on the show before. It's really something how people keep doing this, but they won't admit that a portfolio is really a beauty contest. And they'll say, because they're trying to make it sound great. They're trying to make it sound official. Well, we want to see the person's use cases. No, they don't. And, and even if they do, the use cases in a person's portfolio are not guaranteed by any means to match the use cases that come up at the job that the person is applying for. But if the person is an expert reviewer, they know how to review anybody's portfolio, whether the use cases in the portfolio match or not, you're supposed to be evaluating the candidate not the, the, the applicability of the use cases. But a lot of people don't know that. So that is unjust. That is unfair. That is incivable. That is dysfunctional. And here we are acting like portfolios carry a, between on a percentage of zero to 100, they act like the portfolio carries the weight of 90% of the process when it should really be no more than five or 10, if that. I've been a hiring manager before. I don't even like reviewing portfolios. They don't say anything. And people have learned to fake their way through portfolios, not to mention the fact that a lot of people, they're using AI now to generate portfolio content. They're using AI now to try to fabricate who they are in UX. There are people who steal the portfolio work of others. And now you want to make the portfolio that important? Really? No way. That's why me, I like to talk with people. I want to, them to talk through what's going on. Not just walk me through the project. Let's talk about UX at large. Let's talk about who your favorite authors are or who it is that you tend to learn from or, or what you see as the trends are in UX these days. And then you find out just through a, con a, a conversation like that, I can found out, find out if a person is part of pure UX or part of the cult of UX. And when you hire a person that's part of the cult of UX, they're going to come in and they're going to make your environment toxic. Is that what you want? Because that's what's going to happen. So if you don't learn how to hire hiring managers, I'm talking to you today. If you don't learn how to hire people properly, you are going to destroy your working environment. If you hire somebody who lied to you, about who they are, when they come on board, who do you think they're going to do or what they're going to do? Who do you think they're going to be when they come on board? These people are going to misrepresent who they are. They're going to misrepresent other people on the team. And now you're going to be hemorrhaging profits. The, the profit that's generated by that department, the projected profit, you're going to start losing it. So hire the right people and don't depend on portfolios so much. This insistence, which is what I actually said on social media on using portfolios, is criminal in, in that there are tons of critical elements associated with the candidate's value proposition that cannot or will not be demonstrated within that portfolio. If you don't know that, you will put too much weight on a portfolio and everybody's going to suffer, including the person you should have hired. So let's remember that. 
today. And people who know UX know that what I'm saying is true. The people who are faking it till you make it, and there's a huge fake it till you make it crowd today. They're not going to face that because they don't want to admit that they've been wrong. They don't want to admit that they've got to work harder to hire the right people. And, and working harder to hire the right people is actually great. It can cost, the, the numbers I heard years ago was that it can cost roughly fifty to $70,000 in effort every time you replace a single person in your department. Don't you want to keep that number minimal? Well, that means that you have to hire properly. You have to evaluate people properly because you want to hire in a way that you're offsetting attrition. But if you're bringing in somebody who's going to make the department toxic, that's going to, you're going to pay for that. The department is going to leak that money. If you, I mean, people actually, I've talked about this before. People give me the blues sometime because I have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of stops on my resume. But frankly, I have a lot of stops on my resume because I work at a lot of toxic places. And, and they didn't hire properly and they had people on their teams. They were doing all kind of crazy stuff. And this kind of stuff will affect you at the health level. It will affect you in your family. It will affect you in your physical, your psychological, your mental, your emotional well-being. And so you want to have the right people because then coming to work becomes a joy. Coming to work is enriching. Coming to work is beneficial. Coming to work is profitable for the individual. This only happens, though. If you hire the right way. So all I can do is beg folks to hire the right way. That's all I can say. That's all I can ask you to do. Number two, a lot of companies today depend upon design exercises. Some of them actually have realized that portfolio is not the way to go. We don't want to see a portfolio less. We're going to be better than the other company. We're going to do design exercises. Well, um, the next three of these, actually the next four all revolve around design exercises, but we're going to talk about different aspects of what's wrong with the design exercise bit today. Design exercises, they, they, they attempt, this is going to show you how, how silly and how misguided this is. Design exercises attempt to embody a broad landscape of skills, but you're doing it in a snapshot. It's like taking a picture have you ever thought about it? I mean, I'm a, a photographer. Some of you know this. Have you ever thought about what happens when you take a photograph, when you take a picture? You froze a fraction of a second, depending upon the shutter speed. Was it 1 25th, 1 100th, 1 1,000th of a second? Whatever it was, you froze a moment in time. And But you took that photo, you took that, that picture, you took that image at an event that, say, lasted for an hour. The picture that you're taking when you ask somebody to do a design exercise cannot accurately represent who a person is. It can give you a snapshot. And, and when it gives you a snapshot, you're supposed to evaluate the snapshot. You, you can't, you, you're only, you're trying to do something. In, in the over the course of 20 to 30 minutes. And, but how much experience does that person have? Do they have a year of experience? Are they just getting started in UX? Two years, five years, eight years, 10 years, 15, 20, 25? How much experience do they have? If that person has a lot of experience and you're trying to pare it down to a 20 or 30 minute exercise, what that person brings to the table cannot and will not be demonstrated enough for you to judge them accurately. So you have to design the exercise in a way so it does give you the snapshot. And guess what? And I'm getting into one of the other topics now. It simply can't be done. It can't be done. You, so I, I've designed exercise before. Might as well insert this here. When I was a hiring manager for an unnamed company, I designed exercises. And what I did, part of what I did that I never see anybody do when there's a design exercise is I fully set the stage. I understand that a design exercise is research. What are we researching? We're researching the candidate. Everybody who who comes forth, needs to do the same exact exercise, number one. 
Number two, the scenario in which they are, are participating needs to be explained. And I always tell people, I know we're just doing an exercise. I know we're not spending a, an exorbitant amount of time on this. I know we're only taking a snapshot. I just want to understand. I want to get a better idea how you think. And just like we, we do when we're researching, we always work to put the participant at ease. We always work. We, we do an icebreaker. We try to get them to relax. We want to put somebody in the best possible state for them to execute. And a take-home exercise, some people, well, we, I, I hear you, Derek. That's why I give them take-home exercises. That doesn't change anything, especially if it's fictitious. And I'm getting into one of the other points. I'm actually wrapping the other four points into this one. Why in the world would you give somebody a fictitious exercise when the fictitious exercise, it actually favors the person with the, less, with the lesser amount of experience? When somebody has, I have a lot of experience. I just had an exercise recently. I did a design exercise. It made no sense. I, don't, I, I, I deal with reality so much. Why in the world would you want to expose me to a fictitious situation when we could actually talk about what I did and then talk about what I did and evaluate what I did? Because it's what I did that tells you what I'm going to do. It's not what this little fabricated scenario is. And I'm a former instructional designer. I'm a formal trainer. I don't want to engage in, I don't like role playing. I've engaged with so many things from a perspective of reality. I'm thinking, why in the world do I want to do something that doesn't exist? Why do I want to make something up? Facebook is notorious for that. When you interview for certain roles at Facebook, they ask you to make something up. Again, that is an embedded act of incivility that favors the less experienced professional. You've automatically, I, I know somebody knows that this is what happens. It takes the more experienced person and it casts us off. It discards us from a passive aggressive perspective. Passively aggressively, you're kicking the experienced people out. And, and it's, it's incivil or uncivil. Yeah, in, that's the word. <laughs> it's incivil. It's unfair. It's dysfunctional. That's not meant to generate. What do we do when we conduct research? We're trying to, to obtain actionable, trustworthy, and reliable data. If you put together flawed means, one of the other, my other points here today, one of the five, when you put together a flawed means of trying to evaluate someone's, the viability of someone's candidacy, that's not going to work. It's not going to work. And, and especially as I throw a little bit more incivility in here, when I see people doing it, because there's so much sexism at work in UX today. I love my sisters in UX, but the truth of the matter is there's a lot of folks, they want to see another woman. They want to see another lady get the position. So they treat the guy candidates differently because they want the women to get the role. I'm just telling you that it's happening. And it's crazy that they do that. And you see, you see yourself cast off. You see other people cast off. And then you see somebody else on, on LinkedIn celebrating the fact they got a position when you know for a fact that the way that they handled the hiring process was, was unfair. And, and it favored people with less experience. And I had an experience once where they said, I, I got feedback from somebody later. I didn't ask for it. Don't like feedback because it's always something crazy. And it's always something that subjects you to, to some type of mental abuse. And the person said, yeah, well, you know, we talked to Darren, but Darren was, he didn't really demonstrate that he knew how to collaborate. If I've been doing the work for 28 years, you know how laughable that is? I've been doing the work for 28 years. I've worked all the way up to Fortune 50. I've done almost every type of UX there is imaginable. I've worked in almost every type of project there is imaginable. And I collaborated on every last one of those projects in particular over the last, since 2005. And even when I was doing freelance and doing UX part-time during the day, I was still collaborating with people. You can't get anywhere without collaborating. So when you see success, I mean, we talked recently about on, on LinkedIn about the differences between CVs and resumes. And a lot of uh, overseas, People call resumes, when they say CV, they're talking about what we call a resume in the States. 
In the States, a CV and a resume are two different things. A resume is a very a succinct, a compact, a, 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 a scaled down in many cases. It's, it's giving you the bare minimum, showing you a history of this person's, uh, of this person's employment, their employment history over the course of their career. And, and it is maybe listing a couple of accomplishments at each job. It's limited in length. Your resume is not supposed to be more than three pages, although people are starting to send four page resumes. My resume is four pages. I, I've been doing, I've been working for a long time. What do you want me to do? I can't have a one page resume. That's not even remotely possible. Then you'll say, I don't have enough experience. That's not, that's not remotely possible. Uh, but then the CV not only lists, it, it actually lists where you worked and that's it. So you just get a list of where you've been. And then the rest of the CV categorically breaks down what you did over the course of your career. So it lists out all the projects you worked on, all the speaking engagements, everything you've ever done at all the positions that you listed in the first part of the CV are in the CV. And a CV, guess what? It doesn't have a page limit. So you can turn in a CV. It can be 20 pages long. It can be 25 pages long. It can be 30 pages long. And, and there are times I actually submit a CV because I want them to see what I have done. And I actually might start doing that even more in the future because I want them to see what I've accomplished. When you see what I've accomplished, you're not going to sit there and say, oh, Darren hasn't done any collaboration. Because when you see how much work I've done, it's impossible to do what I've done and not collaborate. So it's amazing how people will, they'll draw a conclusion that really is birth out of and feeds their bias. There's a vicious cycle that it comes out of the bias and then it reinforces the bias. It makes them feel better about the bias. But if you think that somebody who's been doing UX for eight, nine, 10 or more years has never collaborated and you feel comfortable that your conscience will allow you to say that that person doesn't know how to collaborate, uh, those people are part of the cult of UX. They're, they're part of the people that I've talked about on this show recently that are trying to get rid of all the people with the extensive experience. They want us to be gone so that they can take all the top seats. That's what they want to do. And you want us to look like we're incompetent so you can, so you can say we're incompetent. You want to you justify that. But frankly, those folks are just liars. That's all. They're just liars. And I'm glad I didn't get that job because then I would have been working with a bunch of liars, frankly. So anyway, that's the way that works. So design exercises, again, I put people at ease. I let them know. I want them to know that I'm just trying to look at how you think. And I give them a, a problem to solve that can be done, watch this, within the time that we're talking. I'm not going to give them something that's going to cause them to go digging in the weeds about something. We're going to do something very basic. And I know that if a person cannot get through something that basic, we don't want to hire them. I know that that person is part of the fake it till you make it crowd. If they can't, can't get through something that simple, I know that person is part of the cult of UX. And so I'm going to discard that person because they're trying to fake their way into a role. If somebody really knows UX, they'll realize, ah, this is pretty simple. Yeah. Boom, 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 boom. And they'll just give it to you. And, and it's funny that one exercise I did recently. They gave me X number of exercises to choose from. I did one, but when you, I mean, this is an anal discipline, folks. When you give somebody who's very experienced a problem and it's too complex that, that this, it can really take them down a rabbit hole, the discipline person, the person who's been in the discipline, I should say, a very long time, we're going to go down a rabbit hole. There is no avoiding that. So I know that. So I design, when I design my exercises, I do it in a way where it's rabbit hole proof. It is so simple that they can just, they can do it, they can address what we're trying to address, and they can answer the questions. And, and, and I ran a few people through that exercise, and all of them excelled at it. That's how you do it. You don't create an issue. You don't have a poor UX to your uh, that, that's manifested through your design exercise. You can see design exercises and tell that the people that designed it are bad at UX because, and a lot of UXers don't UX their resources. That, that happens a lot. 
but that means that you lack personal UX maturity. I've been around long enough to know you don't do that. A lot of other people haven't been around long enough. So that means that, and that's fine. You know, you are who you are, you are what you are. But that person, the people in that example that I gave you, they're impacting my future. They're impacting my livelihood. And I'm, I'm the proxy right now because there are other people listening to this that, Darren, I, I went ex- through that exactly, right? And so we're helping you to reconcile it, right? That's what we were talking about earlier. Th- these people are impacting your ability to retire. They're impacting your ability to put your child through school. They're impacting the ability to help your spouse to meet their dreams because they are, they are dysfunctionally, unethically, and inequitably, in an unfair way, processing you as a job candidate. Does everybody understand the crime? Of the, I'm talking like you folks are here. If, do you understand how criminal this is? How sad this is? So don't design exercises that are so broad that it, that is going to, as I've also experienced several times in my career, when you have people who lack experience evaluating somebody that has extensive experience the extensively experienced person is always going to mention a lot of things that those people cannot relate to and now the crime is going to manifest itself the discrimination the incivility the the unfairness is going to start manifesting itself and, and, and so I want to branch off from that and give you another aspect. So we already overlapped the other four here. But I was asked in one interview that, you know, we want to we want to conduct like a, a simulation of a design sprint. Bad idea. Bad, bad, bad idea. When you conduct a design sprint or a design workshop in a workplace, how long does that take? And now You want to pare that down to 20 or 30 minutes and then evaluate whether or not this person is a candidate based on a fictitious scenario that we're going to do in a fraction of the time that it would normally take place. Folks need to start evaluating talent. I mean, people, I, I worked at one company where before you were supposed to participate in interviews, you had to go through training. That company made sure that everybody who was in interviews operating as an interviewer, that they knew what they should and should not do, not only from a legal perspective to know what and what not to do to keep the company from getting sued, but to be able to learn how to evaluate talent the right way. I went through training at that nameless company, which was interesting because it was a very toxic company also, but they made sure to do that. So we have to make sure if if you're going to do something in 30 minutes, just talk. I mean, I I wish more people would follow the model that I have. Just talk to people. Find out who they are as a person. Not the people like I've seen people come into interviews and then they start throwing pictures of their family around. That's an indirect way to beg for a job. That that has your pictures of your family. Somebody's pictures of their family doesn't qualify them. And you can't even ask somebody if they're married or personal questions like that. And a person brings something associated with, with factors that can result in a lawsuit. When they bring them in, actually, that's grounds to not move that person forward in the process. Because they're trying to manipulate and trying to make the interview political. But let's get off of that. <laughs> that that's something else we can deal with another time. And maybe with some of my my guests. One of the other elements, though, is you have people who are participating. I just mentioned some of us were trained on what to do if we were if we were participating in the interview process. But you have people. I mean, I'm an educator. I teach at five universities on the books at six. I've taught as as many as seven before. The but the thing is, what I'm trying to get at is I know how to assess people. I have to do it as an educator. And I was, I've was i been an educator longer than I've been doing UX-related work. And you have to, I've been a coach before. When I was a coach, I had to assess. I've been an umpire. When I was an umpire, I had to assess. I know how to assess talent. And, and I started coaching. Oh, my God. I'm not going to tell you when I started coaching. I used to coach a woman's softball team. The, so I assessed talent. You know how to assess talent based on the venue in which you're operating. But for some reason, 
there are people who participate in UX interviews these days and they do not know how to assess talent. And, and that, that is a problem. So when you have people who don't know how to assess talent and don't know how to design vehicles by which to assess talent, that means that it is impossible for the results to come out of those assessments that come out of those interviews to be accurate. You're going to hire the wrong person. You're going to discard the wrong person. And so these are some of the dysfunctions that are, that are in the wild today. And those are the points. Five different points. I'm going to go over these again, and then we'll, we'll touch on our closing notes, and we'll be done with this episode. But remember, the insistence on using portfolios, it's criminal, and that there are tons of critical elements associated with a candidate's value prop that can't or won't be demonstrated therein. So be careful with this portfolio thing. And I, I hope there's a shift because a lot of people are being mishandled through this portfolio thing. Design exercises attempt to embody a broad landscape of skills and the equivalent of a snapshot. That's what it is. And in other words, what someone brings to the table can't and won't be demonstrated in a 20 or 30 minute exercise, whether they take it home or not. It's not going to be demonstrated. I just remembered I had a, an interview I went to once and they gave me a design exercise. And this was for a design role. And they had the research people evaluate me during the exercise. Guess what wasn't going to come out of that interview? Them understanding who I really was and what I brought to the table to have researchers evaluating designers. That was, that was ridiculous. I knew I wasn't going to get that job and, and away we went. And, 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 but it has gotten worse. That was a few years ago. But the whole landscape has just become worse and worse in the last few years at an accelerated rate. I think, too, the fact that we had all the layoffs in the last couple of years or so has not really helped. And, and so things are really getting worse. But again, third point, simulating a design sprint in 30 minutes, it simply can't be done properly. It is grossly unfair. It is a dysfunctional act. It can't and won't be done in the workplace. Never. You'll never have a 30 minute design sprint in the workplace. And it shouldn't be used as a means to assess talent either. It, it's uncivil. It's dysfunctional. It's unfair. When the people who design the aforementioned exercises don't actually know how to assess the talent or design things that support assessment, if somebody doesn't know how to design an assessment, it's impossible for the results to come out of that interview to be accurate. It's impossible. Face it. Face it today. And lastly, asking people with extensive experience to participate in a fictitious exercise instead of talking about their past experience walking through what they've done in the past, that puts those people at a gross disadvantage and it is grossly unethical. It's, it also discriminates against people with extensive experience and some people actually know that this is what's going to happen, but they don't care because they're always trying to find ways to cast off the more experienced people anyway. So in all these things, what we're seeing today is less qualified people getting jobs that they shouldn't. You see these people celebrating their hiring on LinkedIn. I feel sorry for a lot of them. And a lot of times I want to say, you have my condolences because I know what they're getting into. While the more qualified people and the truly qualified people are actually getting discarded at, a, at, a, at an alarming and astronomical rate in 2024, in June of 2024, their careers are potentially or temporarily derailed through these, these dysfunctional hiring and evaluatory uh, uh, practices. It, it's really malpractice. We can't even call it a practice. Uh, we need to understand that it's malpractice today. So in closing, again, building on that, somebody's going to say, Darren, what should we do about it? Well, number one, I mentioned several things that we should do throughout my address. So there's that. But what I have found is that usually when people hear somebody like me calling out what's wrong, they're not asking what we should do because they want answers. It's because they're being condescending. It's because they're being controlling and they want me to shut up or they feel that what I'm saying is worthless. When the truth of the matter is that prudent people, all we need to do is identify. Isn't it ironic that this is what we do in UX? When we know there's a problem, all we have to do is hear there's a problem and we know let's solve it. We don't wait for somebody that told us about the problem to give us the answers. We're going to go and figure it out. 
So I'm talking to wise people today. I'm talking to prudent people. I'm talking to people of action. I'm not talking to trolls. I'm not talking to complainers. I'm not talking to people who are looking for an excuse to just start a bunch of riffraff. I'm not talking to people addicted to straw man arguments. I'm, pre- I'm presenting situations. There is a nail in your tire. Do you need me to tell you what to do with that? Or do you, do you have anything that you can bring to the table to help resolve this issue? So these people, they ask because they want me to, again, either shut up, and that's the kind of response that comes from the entitled crowd, and a lot of times it comes from the beginners because they don't want to hear it. And, and you're either going to hear me tell the beginners now, or the beginners are going to run smack dab into this stuff over the next five years, and then they're going to wish they had listened to me five years prior to that. So that's, that's number point number two in closing. Point number three in closing, it was, it was just recently, not very long ago at all, that new UXers were constantly complaining because it seemed like all the jobs seemed to favor people with more experience, which, number one, that's in any discipline. Less than 3% of the jobs available, somewhere between 2 and 3%, around in there, less than 2 3% of the jobs available are for entry-level people. So entry-level people keep wanting that number to get bigger, and, and all that does is make things worse. But then again, on the flip side, it actually happened. Because the tables have turned. And now you see director and manager roles for people with one year of experience. Not one year in managing people, one year of experience, period. And, and, and a lot of companies, all they want to hire is people that just graduated from boot camps. All they want to hire is somebody who just came through the Google program. And some people are saying, show me that job, Darren. Well, you need to get busy instead of looking for handouts. Go and did, did you look for a job when you were 16? Did you look for a job when you were 18? It doesn't change when you're 20, 25, 30, 40, go in and, and hit the circuit. Go in and, uh, and start looking for jobs. Go to Monster's still out there. Go look at Monster. Go to Career Builder. Go to Dice. Go to LinkedIn. Go to Glassdoor. Go to Indeed. Look for the jobs and apply and stop looking for handouts because nobody owes you anything. That's the entitled mindset because you, you think somebody owes you something. Nobody owes any of us anything so we have to work for it. So go and apply. Go and apply and keep planting those seeds. I always like the metaphor of, of applying for jobs is planting a seed. And if you don't plant a seed, nothing will grow. So keep planting it. Eventually, something will come through. And that's the mentality that you have to have today. But again, yeah, everybody's complaining. Mm, things have changed quite a bit. Uh, the next point, I'm not going to fix this by myself. So when people ask me what to do about it. Don't ask me what to do as if it's my job to fix it. Uh, we, we're going to fix this together. All together. Again, the prudent, when we see a problem, prudent people, wise people, responsible people, accountable people, they take it as a call to action and they get to work. So be one of those people. And then the last point in closing, and, and this is sort of a, a summary statement, basically, but hiring in UX, it just needs to be fixed today. Hiring needs to be fixed. I've been calling this out time and time again on the show. I'm calling it out again. I want to put it on everybody's radar. Do what you're supposed to do in the midst of it, because in the midst of everything being wrong, you can still find a job. Is is it is it uh, is there a hard way to go? Yeah, it's challenging. It's rough. It's insane. And the more experienced you are, actually, the worse it is. So congratulations to those of you keep coming up the ladder. It's going to get worse. You don't want to experience what people like me are experiencing because they throw us out in a heartbeat because they want the the five-year person, the six-year person. You know how many jobs I'm seeing now that want five-year? They want a senior at five years, but really you're not a senior till you had at least eight years of real experience, which means that eight years could, in some cases, it equals 12. In some cases, it's, it's not just eight years no matter where you work. That eight years depends on where you've worked. That's why we say it takes eight to 10 years to be a senior. If you've only worked at one company, you actually lack perspective. And, and you may not be able to relate to what's happening at another company. So that, that's a sliding scale in a sense. But basically, three to seven years is mid-level. You're not a senior. You're not a senior. You've only been doing the work for a year. You're not a senior. I saw somebody that called himself a a UX AI leader, and, and they just got their job like six months ago. We need to stop doing this. We need to stop selling ourselves on these titles, inflating titles, inflating our identities. 
uh, because all it's doing is creating problems for the discipline at large. But hiring needs to be fixed. We're all going to need to, at some point, some of us can contribute more than others in resolving the issue, but it's going to take the entire village of UX to get this, this thing done today. Be committed to getting it done. Be committed to operating in a way that you're not dysfunctional. Be committed to making sure you're fair, especially if you're a hiring manager or have say in the hiring process. Be, be determined to be civil. D- don't be unethical uh, because a lot of people in UX today, they are just that. They are dysfunctional, they are unfair, and they are incivil. And everybody suffers when it happens. It, and if you're not suffering now, keep, keep hanging in there. It's going to find you. <laughs> it's going to find you. It's a matter of time. And you don't want to experience it. We didn't experience it. Prior to 2010, folks, we didn't experience. I experienced it one time, actually, uh, prior to 2010. One time. And, and it was actually due to the isms, the racism and the sexism and things like that was, was why it happened to me. And I recognized it. I reconciled it and I moved on. And down the years, I ran into those same people at other jobs. And guess what? The same thing happened because those isms had not changed. The racism and the and the sexism and then the eventual ageism, uh, they manifest themselves. And those things are embedded within that dysfunction, the inequitability and the incivility. So, but I hope that it gets fixed in UX. I hope for everybody's sake. I hope that I'm, even if I'm not still in the workforce, I, I hope that I'm able to hear about it from other people that things finally worked out. But this is a problem today. And it's not until this gets fixed, that we start seeing the benefits start to trickle back uphill and you'll start to see it impact. When hiring gets fixed, it'll it'll help impact the UX maturity levels at organizations. It'll impact the perception of UX. It'll impact the value proposition. It'll impact everything. And we can refer, we can return, I should say, to our glory days when we were understood We were appreciated. And even though we had to explain who we were to a degree, at least people were professional enough and gave us space to hear us out. Uh, Today, that's not happening. They're trying to redefine UX and tell us what UX is. And a lot of people who've been in UX for a while are actually kowtowing and accepting that. And that's sad. And you owe more to the discipline than that. So let's be better and let's make the discipline better. Sound good? All right. That's it for today, folks. Thanks for taking the time to listen to us today. Uh, we, we will be back with you next week with another extended anniversary celebration, four years. And then we're going to have some, some upcoming announcements, some big announcements, some things that are being developed that we want to share with the audience. But it is time to sign off. So this is Darren Hood, the host of The World of UX, wishing everyone all the best. And until next time, happy UXing, everybody. 